Do you know of the early Hollywood actor Roman Navarro? He is considered the first Mexican actor to succeed in Hollywood. He starred in silent films and became a sex symbol after Rudolph Valentino died in 1926. But Navarro lived a double life and concealed a secret about himself from the public. On October 30th, 1968, Navarro died inside his 1945 Spanish colonial style home in Laurel Canyon, North Hollywood at 69. He had been brutally beaten and robbed. Who murdered the man dubbed the Latin lover and why? Welcome to Nightmare Houses. Jose Ramon Gil Samaniego was born on February 6, 1899 in Durango City, Mexico to Dr. Mariano N. Samaniego and his wife Leonor. The Samaniegos were wealthy and an influential and well-respected family in Mexico. Many family members had prominent positions in state affairs and were held in high esteem by the president. The family moved to Los Angeles to evade the Mexican Revolution in 1913 when Ramon was just a young teen. Teenager. Ramon left Los Angeles for New York and began his career in 1917, playing minor roles, supplementing his income by working as a singing waiter, a taxi dancer, and doing other odd jobs before he returned to Hollywood. After working as an usher in a movie house, he decided to pursue films and gave them a try. He made his film debut in the 1918 The Little American, starring Mary Pickford. He continued to work as an extra, appearing in many films for the next five years. Director Rex Ingram cast him in The Prisoner of Zenda. Ingram began to promote him as a rival sex symbol to Rudolph Valentino and suggest he changed his name to Navarro. From 1923, he began to play more prominent roles, and his role in Sacre from 1923 brought him his first significant success. In Ben-Hur, Ramon achieved considerable success in 1925 when his revealing costumes caused a sensation. By this time, he had been elevated into the Hollywood elite. Like many stars of his era, Ramon Navarro engaged Sylvia of Hollywood, an early fitness guru, as a personal trainer. Even though Ramon Navarro was considered one of Hollywood's most prominent sex symbols, he hid a deep secret. He and his family were Roman Catholic, and Ramon considered becoming a priest at one point. But he was a homosexual, something that would haunt and conflict him throughout his life, and something he kept very private, as he identified as heterosexual publicly. In the early 1920s, Ramon had a romantic relationship with composer Harry Parch, who worked as an usher at the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Ramon broke off the affair as he became more successful as an actor. He was also romantically involved with Hollywood journalist Herbert Howe, serving as his publicist in the late 20s, and with Noel Sullivan, a wealthy man from San Francisco. At this time, he became an alcoholic, likely to distract himself from his troubles and conflicts. His battle with alcohol would continue for the rest of his life. When Rudolph Valentino died in 1926, Ramon Navarro became the screen's leading Latin actor, though ranked lower than his MGM contemporary actor John Gilbert as a leading man. Ramon was famous as a swashbuckler in action roles and considered one of his day's great romantic lead actors. He appeared with Norma Shearer in The Student Prince of Old Heidelberg in 1927, and Joan Crawford in Across to Singapore in 1928. In 1929, he made his first talking film in Devil May Care, starring as a singing French soldier. He starred with Dorothy Janis in The Pagan in 1929 and Greta Garbo in Mata Hari in 1931. Ramon earned more than $100,000 per film at the peak of his career. He invested some of his income in real estate. Lloyd Wright, the son of renowned architect Frank Lloyd Wright designed Ramon's first Hollywood Hills residence. Wright designed a 2,700 square foot, three bedroom, three bathroom home originally for Ramon's manager, Lois Samuel, and his wife in 1928 on a 1,300 square foot hillside lot in the Los Feliz neighborhood of Los Angeles. When Ramon discovered that Lois Samuel had embezzled funds from him to pay for the house, Ramon Navarro assumed ownership of it in 1931 and moved in. During during his time there, he commissioned Wright to expand the interior and the garden, adding a bedroom, music room, and bedroom suite. 
Street. In 1933, Ramon starred with Marna Loy in The Barbarian, and in 1934, he played opposite Lupe Velez in The Laughing Boy. When his contract with MGM Studios expired in 1935, the studio did not renew it. At age 36, he was now considered a has-been by Hollywood executives. Though his contract and seemingly his career ended, he could still maintain a comfortable lifestyle and remain very wealthy. Still, he moved out of the Los Feliz Lloyd Wright estate and seemingly bounced around Los Angeles during this time. Ramon continued to act sporadically, appearing in films for Republic Pictures, a Mexican religious drama, and a French comedy throughout the 1940s. He made a triumphant reappearance in 1949 with a role in the film We Were Strangers with John Garfield and Jennifer Jones, but despite talks of a comeback, he was again reduced to only cameo roles. In 1958, he was considered for a role in the television series The Green Peacock with Howard Duff and Ida Lupino after their CBS television sitcom Mr. Adams and Eve, but the project fell through. In 1963, Ramon purchased a Spanish colonial-style home in Laurel Canyon, North Hollywood, where he lived alone. By the 1960s, Laurel Canyon had a reputation for wild parties. The original owners of his home, Mr. and Mrs. C. Raymond Wilson, purchased the property at 3110 Laurel Canyon Boulevard in 1944. In 1945, they built a stunning Spanish and colonial-style two-story residence with five bedrooms, five bathrooms, a formal entry, a spacious open living room, and a formal dining room with a fireplace and high ceilings. The home had a hipped roof, beautiful red Spanish tiles, and a beige color stucco exterior. The property is on nearly one acre and is private and gated with a small guest house and a detached garage, and the primary residence is set back from the boulevard. The Wilsons were wealthy and active in the North Hollywood social scene, and they often hosted social events, parties, and luncheons at their beautiful home. In September 1955, Mrs. Wilson and her friends were enjoying a social gathering at the house when a man broke in armed with a gun. The intruder tied up Mrs. Wilson and her friends, and when Mr. Wilson arrived home later that evening, he too was bound and held at gunpoint. The intruder robbed the home's occupants before fleeing, but fortunately no one was harmed in the incident. The perpetrator managed to get away and was not caught by the police. The incident was likely a terrifying experience for the Wilsons and their guests, but thankfully they recovered from the ordeal without any physical harm. Despite the robbery, the Wilsons remained there until Mr. Wilson died in the early 1960s. Ramon became the second owner of the home after purchasing it. During this time, he kept himself busy on television, appearing in NBC's The High Chaparral as late as 1968. He also maintained his home and had alterations and repairs made throughout the years. While living at the Laurel Canyon home, he had in the past hired prostitutes from an agency to come to his house for sex, preferring young men. In late 1968, two brothers, aged 21 and 17, Paul and Tom Ferguson, originally from Chicago, obtained Ramon's telephone number from a previous client. Ramon invited the two young men over for companionship and sex on October 30, 1968. The Ferguson brothers, however, had other motives. They believed the old Hollywood actor, now aged 69, had money stashed away in his house. When the evening started, the three drank and were friendly. Ramon read Paul's palm and told the young man he saw a bright future. At the piano, Ramon Navarro taught him a song he had composed. The liquor he shared with the young men helped him feel like he wasn't buying companionship. That evening, Paul Ferguson and Ramon Navarro engaged in a sexual encounter in the upstairs master bedroom. But when they were finished, Paul demanded $5,000 from the actor, rumored to be hidden within the house. However, Ramon kept his money in the bank and stock market, and he admitted to the young man he did not have any cash to give. He offered to write them a check, but it was not good enough. At that point, Paul Ferguson, who thought Ramon Navarro was lying to him, beat the actor for information on where he could find the money. Over the next several hours, the actor was beaten and tortured with a silver cane and possibly a silver leaded dildo, rumored to have been given to him in the early 1920s by Rudolph Valentino. Ramon was beaten about the head, back, stomach, and genitals with the weapons. During the beating, which took place in the actor's upstairs 
father's master bedroom, the younger Ferguson, 17-year-old Tom, called his girlfriend in Chicago on the phone in the downstairs living room. He spoke with her for nearly 40 minutes, and she could hear the actor's screams of pain in the background. After the call, the younger brother went to help with the beating. They dragged him into the bathroom to prevent Ramon from slipping unconscious, slapping him alert with cold water. Ramon staggered back into the bedroom. He was reciting the Hail Mary prayer while he was sobbing and collapsed on his knees. They bound him with an electric cord and struck him again and again, at least over 20 times, and tossed his mangled body onto the bed. Before the brothers left, they wrote derogatory messages on the unsweet bathroom mirror with a grease pencil. They scratched his face to suggest that a woman had perpetrated the crime in a vengeful rage. While unknown, Paul Ferguson may have shoved the sex toy used to beat the actor up his rectum. They ransacked the house and discarded old photographs on the floor of Ramon as a young star. The brothers left the house with $20 they took from Ramon's red and blue striped bathrobe pocket. During the night and early morning, Ramon Navarro slowly suffocated to death from his blood. His nose was fractured and there was a laceration across his lips and mouth. His exact time and date of death were never determined. At 8.30 a.m. on October 31st, Ramon's personal secretary, Edward Weber, arrived at the house to report for work. The iron gates of the main entrance were open, but since the front door was locked, Weber had used his keys to let himself in through the kitchen entrance. As he walked into the living room, Weber saw everything was in disarray. Furniture had been overturned, and a pair of eyeglasses were crushed on the floor. Continuing upstairs and calling out, Weber went into the darkened master bedroom. Walking over to the window, he opened the drape slightly. Roman Navarro's nude body, lying face up, was on the far side of the King size bed. Weber realized what he was looking at and saw how badly beaten he was and knew that Ramon Navarro was dead. Weber ran downstairs to the living room and called Ramon's brother Eduardo, the police, the priest at St. Charles Church, and Ramon's friend and publicist, Leonard Shannon. After the police came to the murder scene, they were able to compile a list of phone calls made from the home the night of the murder. They saw the outgoing call to Chicago and reached Tom's girlfriend, who told the police about the screams on the call with her boyfriend that evening. With that information, the police immediately arrested both Ferguson brothers, whose fingerprints and footprints were found all over Ramon's house. The trial of the men became a circus when Paul convinced Tom to admit to the murder. However, since Tom was only 17, he believed he would not get the death penalty. Tom agreed and confessed to the murder, but quickly recanted when prosecutors informed him they would seek the death penalty. Tom then confessed to what really happened that night, and both brothers ultimately received life terms in prison. However, both brothers were paroled less than seven years later and were released in the mid-1970s. Both Paul and Tom Ferguson were later re-arrested for unrelated crimes, for which they served longer prison terms than they did for the murder of Ramon Navarro. Paul Ferguson finally admitted to Ramon's death in an interview in 1998. Tom Ferguson died of suicide on March 6, 2000. 2005, while Paul Ferguson died in 2018 while serving a 60-year sentence for rape in Missouri. Ramon Navarro is buried in the Calvary Cemetery, East Los Angeles, California, and his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame is at 6350 Hollywood Boulevard. After the murder, the home was sold in probate in September 1969 to screenwriter Clifford Gould and his wife. Although the home was valued at over $500,000, Gould paid only $81,000 for it. He remodeled the interior of the home, possibly to remove any lingering memories of the crime that had taken place there. Gould sold the home in 1972 for more than $120,000. Since then, there have been several owners of the property. In 1978, permits were drawn for a pool that remains unfinished today. The hipped roof now has gray composite tiles, and the exterior stucco has been repainted several times, at one point in light orange and then white. The land around the property has been regraded since the 1970s. The home has sold several times, most recently in 1996 and again in 2016, last selling for just over $3.4 million. The listings never mention the murder. The home remains privately owned and
and gated, there are rumors that Ramon Navarro's spirit now haunts his last home. Ramon Navarro was once a legend in early Hollywood for his sex appeal, talent, and smoldering good looks. But in his time, movie stars were forced to keep their private lives secret. But this secret would torment him in life, ultimately leading to his brutal fate and exposing the double life he tried so hard to keep hidden. When he was murdered, he was lonely and had become recluse like some of his other early Hollywood counterparts, who existed in an era where homosexuality was considered taboo. But the magic of his early films will remain forever, and he will always be considered one of the greatest stars of all time. The most tragic element of Roman Navarro's life was that his gruesome death overshadowed his reputation as a talented screen icon. Thank you for listening to Nightmare Houses. For more information, including photos and references, please visit www.nightmarehouses.com. Until next time, goodbye.